Good morning, everyone. This is Naishad Gadani coming to you from Melbourne. And today is our 143rd episode. And today we are <laughs> talking about interview tips, how to stand out in interviews. And we found an expert on that from North Carolina. And as before we came on board, we were talking about that North Carolina would have you know a high concentration of career practitioners or all the people who live in north carolina are smart uh, <laughs> enough to provide you know amazing career advice so that's what we are going to find out today uh, from jeff altman who is also known as the big game hunter uh, and we are you know absolutely delighted to to have jeff and bring a really interesting perspective on on job interviews i know uh, you know we live in a global world where you know interview techniques used in united states to even singapore to australia they are becoming one they are no longer a different job interview techniques and it you know what we are going to talk about is the preparation aspect as well which is where we find the most of the juice around winning the job interview so before we start to talk to jeff let's welcome caroline brown Thanks, Nation. It's great to be here. And yes, we were just saying to Jeff that we've probably interviewed quite a few, well, we have interviewed quite a few experts from um, North Carolina. So um, they must breed them. Yeah, like Nation says, really smart. Jeff, really delighted to have you here. Big game hunter, author, TV host, podcast host. Is there anything that you can't actually do in the career space? Uh, in the career space. Thank goodness you said that. <laughs> You know, having worked in executive search for what worked, felt like a hundred years, yeah. you, know, you know, as you know from working in search, it's it's like recruiter years versus human years. Yeah. And you know, I did it for a long, long time. And yeah. Unlike a lot of people, I have that real world perspective on job hunting that yeah. too few coaches have. Uh, yeah. So. No, there's nothing I haven't done, <laughs> to be honest with you. <laughs> that, that sounds good coming with the name like the Big Game Hunter. So where did you get that name? I'm fascinated. Um, I guess we'll give people some context and then we'll get into your interview tips and, and the ultimate job interview framework. But where did the Big Game Hunter name come from? You know, one thing I noticed in the States as a recruiter is that everyone had, shall we say, ridiculous job titles that far exceeded what they did. Mm. So someone, it was common for someone with two weeks of experience to have a VP title. And then there was the, of course, managing director for North American recruiting or North American talent acquisition, who maybe had two months. Mm. And I was someone who at that point had 25 30 years and i'm wondering when people hear a title they have an association with it and i'm going to be you know tarnished by their behavior so the mm -hmm. question became how can i differentiate myself and brand myself and you know the truth of the matter is there were some people who used to tell me that i was a big game hunter because of the nature of the searches i was working mm -hmm. on and you know the generic a uh, big game hunter didn't really hit, but the big game hunter, mm. that one, that one really resonated for me. And it transitioned well from you know, being a recruiter in the, in the sense of hunting down leaders and staff organization to mm. my coaching mm. life now where I help people perform at a high level, play big mm. in the world instead mm. of being the kind of confined, nicely behave, you know, sort of one box behavior mm. that so many conduct themselves it's really very painful to observe mm. so i want to help people perform better play big yeah fantastic i think that we could all play i don't think we're really aware of what our capabilities are a lot of the time and we really do underestimate ourselves so um, that's such a great way to to look at the way that you might serve and, and help people with um tell us about the ultimate job interview framework how did you what's that about and how did you come to develop it again having worked in search for as long as i have i remembered how i was trained to prepare job applicants to go out on interviews and get hired and mm. it was a little more than give them a firm handshake <laughs> what the, swear in the eye, smile when you meet them sit yeah. down 
answer their questions right and help me earn a fee. Yeah. So, he's a little more Perfect. than that. <laughs> Absolutely. But yeah. not very helpful to the person who was going on an interview. And I started to talk to uh, firms I was working for about their impressions of people. And I started to really dissect the process of interviewing as they were telling me their observations and experiences. And I was hearing about rejections and wins. I started to look at a different way of doing stuff that also leverages. I've got a master's in social work. I trained uh, to be a therapist in private practice. I had the good fortune of meeting my wife along the way. So I only practiced modestly, but I used a lot of the skills to kind of create this framework. And I say a framework because there's very little that you have to remember in this. Mm. It's just, if you can remember a few basic things, it works very, very well. And then from yeah. there, it, it can't help you be better at what you do. It helps you package your knowledge in ways that the interviewer really gets you better. Mm. So what, what, without selling the farm or giving away the farm, what, what does the framework look like? What, how does it set people, set people up? I don't mind giving away the farm. Okay, <laughs> excellent. So I'll just simply say, it starts off with an assumption. Mm. And the assumption is, is even if you've seen a job description, even when you've seen an ad, it's 80% accurate. Mm. And I say that because HR people laugh when I say 80% because they tell me if we're lucky, it's 80%. Yeah, I was thinking you're being generous, but... <laughs> Right. So yeah. what you're working with may not be completely accurate because most of the time they're constructed when someone walks into someone's office on Friday afternoon and says, um, I'm giving notice. And the hiring manager calls over to human resources to say, you got that job description we used to hire Carolyn? Yeah, she mm -hmm. just gave notice and maybe you could get it out to some of our resources and perhaps get some people onto my calendar for Tuesday. <laughs> No one ever updates these things. Mm -hmm. The same job descriptions get recycled year after year after year. And even when the jobs are basically the same, the emphasis of the jobs can be different. Mm -hmm. So I started to realize that the typical interview only afforded people the opportunity to learn about the job at the end. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe there are cultural differences, but normally, a candidate, when they're interviewing, is asked at a point in the interview, so do you have any questions for us? Mm. Mm. And the first question is, tell me about the job. <laughs> that I've just been interviewed for. <laughs> that I've just spent 40 minutes asking your questions yeah. about, and I have no idea whether it's really useful to you. So I decided to, that's the launch point for the framework, mm. is understanding what the role is. So whether you're on camera, doing a video interview, by phone, doing a phone interview, or in person, it all starts off with the same way. Hey, thanks so much for making time to reach out to me. Now, I recall the position description, or a nice schedule this interview for me, and I want to get your take on the role. Mm. Could you tell me about the job as you see it and what mm. I can do to help? Mm. First thing. Mm. If you're doing it in person as you're sitting down in the chair mm. before they say anything to you, you're asking mm. this question. Mm. Why? Because this way you make sure you're on the same page as them. Because when firms interview, the way the power is set up is they have the knowledge of what they're looking for, right? They're up high. Sorry, mm. it's backward for me. <laughs> they're up high and you're down here because yeah. they have all the information. Yeah. So I want to level the playing field and bring it into more balance because kind of like a salesperson who visits a client, salesperson doesn't walk in with their laptop, open it up and say, let me just show you pictures of everything I could do for you. Mm. They want to do like a quick needs analysis. Tell me mm. which problems are. How can I help you? And they say all this kind of stuff designed to elicit what the problem is so that way they can sell to solve it. Mm. So my belief is you don't really know about the job unless you ask this question. Yeah. Unless most of the time all you're doing is talking about what you've done. Mm. 
mm. and not talking about what you've done that matters to them. Mm. That makes sense. Absolutely. Um, Nesh, you look like you're about to say something. Or? No, no, I just wanted to, uh, you know, welcome some of our listeners yeah. who's been joining us. Vijesh, Sarah Carpenter, uh, Noor, uh, and Azar, I think. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, the LinkedIn user says that he has hit the nail right on <laughs> the head when it comes to about the, the uh, you know, really understanding that because because I, I think that that's very, very, very important. I've, I've seen the, the job description being recycled or being used the same. Probably they just changed the updated date from January 2017. Sometimes we don't to even do that. 2018. Right. Right. Think, wow. You see at the bottom of it, it's like authorized 1987 or whatever. You know? It's amazing. It's a global problem. Yeah. <laughs> We had this thing, uh, actually, um, there's this great, I can't remember his name, but he wrote this book in Australia called Weasel Words. And um, it's it's like it's like the blanding, the boringness of language that we all use in management speak nowadays and things like stakeholder engagement, commitment, outcomes. Excuse me, I'm uh, going to throw up all now. Of those, all of those words, you're writing them down. <laughs> all of those words in job descriptions, like you look at a job description and you think you can do it, right? And you go, or you, you know, but what does it mean? And then you're like, I have no idea. I don't know what, you know, stakeholder engagement. It could be that I'm serving flipping burgers at McDonald's or that I'm, you know, representing my company to the, the media and the community. But, you know, they all, all tend to start, sound the same. So I love that idea of, you know, tell me about the job and, and what, what's really involved is a really powerful question. Simple question, but a powerful question. And, and my thinking is, if you just say, tell me about the job, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. it, it's too blunt a question. Yeah. And thus, if you set it, follow my setup, it's three sentences. Yeah. And the first one is just thanking them for making time to, you know, set up the, the video interview, mm -hmm. schedule the interview, the phone, whatever it is. You're thanking them. The second sentence is, you know, you know, Carolyn was kind enough to tell me about the role or I saw the job description and I want to get your take on it. You tell mm. me about the job as you see it and what I can do to help. That's two and yeah. three. That's it. And but it's on your take on it because it obviously, yeah, I love that. That's, that's fantastic. Because, you know, this hiring manager may have been in the job for six months. Mm. That job description may have been in there since 1987. Mm. <laughs> we don't know. So the yeah. idea is what is this manager's view of the role? And mm. what can you do to help? Mm. Gives you the target for what they're aiming for. Mm. And then from there, most managers ask the lazy question. Tell me about yourself. Oh, yes. <laughs> or walk me through your background. Yeah. And thus, my belief is most people will drone on and on about what they've done professionally. And mm. my belief is we live in an ADHD culture where we all have kind of short attention span. So we limit our answers to a minute to a minute 15. That's the starting place. And then from there, there are two parts with a bridge between the two parts of the answer. Mm. You know, I've been in the field now for however long it's been. For the last few years, I've been working for so-and-so, or I've done this and that and this and that. Before that, I worked for, you know, it's kind of standard stuff. And that's the first 20, 25 seconds. Yeah. But there's a moment where you now add one phrase in. It's what I refer to as a bridge phrase. Yeah. But what's probably most relevant in my background for this role oh, <laughs> is, my, is my experience with and this one may be uh, a U.S. centric uh, analogy, but there's a cartoon character named Scooby Doo, which is like a big dog, you know, who is kind of lovable. And invariably, there's one moment in every episode where the dog goes, <laughs> <laughs> and People tell me that hiring Could you just managers. Just do that one more time, Jeff. Sure. <laughs> 
hiring managers give the Scooby-Doo moment. <laughs> it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. and b because suddenly what you're doing, and then, by the way, after that, of course, you connect the dots for them in the remainder of the minute, minute 15, with what you've done that's relevant to what it is that they just told you they're looking for. Yeah. It's yeah. kind of like with resumes. When resumes are constructed, everyone looks for more recent experience that relates to the job that they're trying to do. Mm. And thus, there's a relevancy bias that shows up. The higher up in the resume is, the more we believe it's recent experience and relevant. Mm. And by rather than making them fight to pull the information out from you, <laughs> what you're doing is giving it to them. <laughs> <laughs> Make it easy for them. They have no attention span. They don't want to work hard. Just tell them what you've done that they care about. Yeah. It's not hard. Yeah. And you got to imagine that for you as search professionals, this is going to help you close more business. Yeah. You know, it's, it's really that simple. I developed this in order to fill more jobs. Mm -hmm. And because I knew that. You know, I, I worked most of my career in New York, and I did national recruiting uh, throughout the United States. I always knew I was competing with other search professionals because that's the nature of the market I was in. Mm. And the question was, how can the people I represent stand out and stand out in a good way? Mm. Not, not stand out by showing up a day early for the interview, <laughs> as people sometimes did. <laughs> but... Just following these opening two questions mm. causes people to be advantaged over their competition dramatically. Mm. Mm. And thus, if you can deliver what I call, you know, the single best question to ask on any interview, you know, mm. which is the one about the job, and then answer, tell me about yourself this way, you're off to the races. Mm. You know, right, right off the bat, you're making it easy for them because Put yourself in the hiring manager seat. All they mm. want is the darn job filled. Mm. <laughs> they don't yeah. want to interview all these people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, answer the question as well. Like, yeah, often people go on that waffle tangent. So, yeah. No, no, make it easy for them. Put mm. it on the platter, present it to them. They kind of like it. It looks tasty. <laughs> Give it to them. Give it to them. <laughs> Yeah. Don't make them work so hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think I, you know, uh, Sarah has asked a question. Is this being recorded? Yes, Sarah, it is being recorded. And if you reach out to me, I'll give you a YouTube link where you can find it forever as well. Francisca says hello from Australia. Thank you very much, Francisca. Kaja, and we've got Anand who's joining us from YouTube. Thank you, Anand. Yay. for joining us Thanks for being YouTube. our youtube fan anand we're working on it yes that's <laughs> it please subscribe to our channel um you know as well uh you know i i i think that that idea of um you know asking that question to the hiring manager works really well because it has worked with me when i when i go to the remember the last job that i had I called because the, the job description was a little vague. I did not fully understood that. And I called before even the interview, I, before even started to prepare the application. And then I've got a completely different view because he is a hiring manager was talking just business sense. He was talking about this is what we are looking for, someone who can deliver this program, who can you know get us some employers, who can do this. I said, okay, that's it. Because you know, most of the time it's you know, it the job description is written by human resource professionals and they use a lot of eloquent languages into that, which is which is not necessarily translated into a resume. People don't 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 talk like that, right? People talk I want this person to do one, two, and three, four activities. And these are the key, you know, outcomes for that. And I think that is very important. And that's why asking those questions, because I'm pretty sure that not, not many hiring managers are asked that question as well. No. And it, it causes you right away, as I said, to level the playing field between the, sorry, my hands are, they, they want to go to the right level. <laughs> Uh, it, it right away it helps you connect with them better because yeah. the power differential has been leveled and thus 
you know, when you think about the standard interview with the subservient person arriving there, hat in hand, mm. politely sitting down or waiting on uh, for the video interview, and they're going to be obedient and get themselves onto the conveyor belt of the process and get moved along. Mm. You know, it's how do you win? Mm. You're just like everyone else. Yeah. Have you set that up in that way because people make up their minds pretty quickly as well? So it's sort of cre creating that kind of halo effect for the rest the rest of the interview as well? It works that way. Mm. But I looked at it initially very strategically just from the standpoint of people don't know what the job really is. Yeah. Let's find out what the job really is and then tell them what you've done that relates to the job as it really is. Mm. Because, you know, again, I don't think this is unique to the United States. When candidates go on interview, they like to talk a lot. Mm. <laughs> and they talk about things and put people to sleep. Yeah. And cause the hiring managers to start thinking about their next meeting. When's lunch? What time do, <laughs> do I have to meet my wife, husband, or partner? And anything other than staying engaged with the person that's in front yeah. of them. Yeah. So just the idea of shortening answers to a minute to a minute 15 and yeah. giving people an outline for follow up questions that you can pretty well predict mm. and thus be prepared with your answers for mm. because you're kind of leading the interview by following. If you, mm. if you notice what I'm doing here, you know, once you, you confirm the job, you're going to tell them what you've done that relates and you're going to guide them to predictable follow-up questions that they mm. might ask that you can be rehearsed for. Mm. Mm. And yeah. eventually they get to the point where they're going to ask you what are nicknamed the behavioral interview questions. Mm. Why not be prepared with three stories before you walk in the door mm. <laughs> that generally fit what you believe the job to be? but that mm. you can adapt based upon what you hear. Mm. So, I'm sorry. Oh, no, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. That's okay. But my thinking is, you know, people go into interviews and they kind of wing it, which is mistake number one that job yeah. hunters make consistently. They're not rehearsed, okay. they're not practiced, and I don't know what it's like in other parts of the world, but every great athlete in the world I know of practices. Mm. And, and every great entertainer in the world always rehearses. And they mm. all do it a lot. Mm. But job hunters go on interviews, and the first time the words ever come out of their mouth are not yeah. a rehearsal. They're actually when they're on stage. They're <laughs> living. And most people are it's not It's funny, that, isn't it? Because it is really pow like a, powerful to actually speak your answers out. Because the first time you say something, you do waffle, and you do realize that you haven't really done the homework. But when you kind of talk it out or talk it out to the mirror or talk it out to practice or whatever, it, it actually firms it up in your brain. And I always think it kind of, if you get if you get your stories down pat um, and the gist of the stories down pat, you're then prepared for any unexpected questions because you don't have to think about, you know, you don't have to think about that part. You're not overloaded in, in the interviews. So, but what, um with behavioural interviews, um, what are some of the um, tips that you have for people around those or behavioral well, questions, sorry? So the first thing is there are three formats for answering questions. Mm. If you're at a staff level, the acronym that I've always taught people is STAR, situation mm. or task, action result. For example, I was assigned a project to do such and such. Mm. <laughs> you know, that's the situation or task, all right? And the, the project had to be done by such and such date and time. I mm -hmm. had six weeks to do it, and it's pretty a pretty predictable introduction. Mm -hmm. Then we go into the action. So what I did was, <laughs> with the result being, and the result mm -hmm. always has some version of metric, money mm -hmm. saved, money earned. If you're not in a role that involves that percentage improvement. Mm -hmm. If you're at a manager level and above, up to the C-suite, the acronym I work with is SOAR, S-O-A-R, Situation, mm -hmm. Objective, Action, Result. And, you know, in terms of the situation you step into, you add in, you know, size and scope of the project, number of people, mm 
you know, the number of dollars in revenue, because there's always a difference between a $200,000 project and a 2 million mm -hmm. and a 200 million and a 2 billion <laughs> and a $200 billion project. So you always want to give people a sense of the size and scope of the endeavor that they're stepping into so that this way it gives texture to the story. Uh, and again, with the objective, you're tr trying to give people a sense of what it is you were set out to accomplish. So mm -hmm. one of the classics is I took over a project from my predecessor who resigned. The project was four weeks behind already. We had a staff of 42 who were left frustrated because they didn't know what was going to happen next. Story, story, story. Mm. And what we had to do was deliver this thing no mm. matter what. Mm. So what I did was met with the user population, reset the priorities, you know, and, and reset their expectations, understood where things broke down, pulled everyone together, got their buy-in to the idea of we're going to do whatever it takes to get this thing down with the result mm. being we delivered it three days early and everyone lived happily ever. It's, it's like a movie story. You're the, the hero job broke and it rained again. <laughs> <laughs> it's hysterical, but it's kind of like a movie with you being the hero or heroine. Yeah. And, and everyone yeah. lives happily ever after. You helped yeah. them make so much money, save so much money, created a wonderful improvement. <laughs> it's wonderful. And everyone lives happily ever after. <laughs> I think it's interesting with that because the key, I reckon, is the setup in that, isn't it? It's really evoking a dire situation in the, you know, that, that or not a dire situation, but a real challenge that you faced in that. It's that you, if you just sort of really factual in it or unemotive, then people don't get how amazing you were with the actions that you took um, in that particular scenario. And I think people do tend to actually, you know, one of the most frustrating things I ever had when I was interviewing people is say, could you give me an example? And they go off on La La Land in terms of, well, one, you know, that, that they don't give an example and then you have to go, you know, but, but an actual example or an actual time, um, which I think is around preparation, lack of preparation yes. for the job, but it's really frustrating on the other side. Yes. And the thing I'd like to remind people of is there's theatre to interviewing. Mm. It's performance art and by performance i don't mean lying i want to be clear about that i don't mm. believe lying on interviews but i do believe you're a salesperson trying to sell your lines to the person that you're talking to so that they believe you because when firms hire competence is only one thing that they look for they look for self-confidence character chemistry maybe a little bit of charisma because charismatic people always do better than non-charismatics ultimately this all adds up to they want to trust someone it's the feeling that you give them in the course of your behavior not just your lines but how you conduct yourself in the, in the interview that causes them to trust you because with no trust they go on to someone else just like when we don't trust the salesperson who comes to, you know, to sell us something, we go, uh-huh, and they start backing away. Yeah. <laughs> figuring out how quickly they can get out of a meeting. Well, yeah. We're the same way. I wanted to ask you about that because I think it's a really critical point around that kind of charisma, first of all, but trust. So what are some of the things that you can do to show that you're a trustworthy person? I mean, sometimes if people... You go into an inter like I've interviewed people and I've like I'm like I, I I need to keep the door open in this scenario because I feel uncomfortable like I've had that gut feel, and I don't think those things you can you know do anything to control in terms of how you might present or how people might react to you. But what are some of the things that you you can control that might convey that you're a trustworthy person? I'm going to flip it to you for a second. And in mm. that situation, what gave you concern? I couldn't pinpoint it. I'm thinking of one particular person. I really felt unsafe in that person's environment, in, in that room, and I couldn't couldn't pinpoint it. But if I'm thinking about other people, it would be um, showing up on time, just eye contact, listening, you know, like a sense of that really involved and engaged in the interview by listening. Um clarity of answers as in 
Yes. Um, no vagueness. Like I, I feel like I'm a fly on the wall when they're talking about a scenario that, that happened to them. So, yeah, a whole range of things. But the Trust is yeah. the feeling. And it, yeah. comes, it comes with congruence in the presentation with the expectation. Mm. So when you think about hiring a senior leader, they're going to conduct themselves in a particular way that's going to allow you to feel comfortable with them. Now, I could see this woman leading this organization. I could see this man stepping up and given our, you know, our corporate culture, he can get stuff done. Whatever it is, there's a congruence between the words and the manner that evokes confidence. And thus, that comes from how you present yourself. Because I was joking with someone earlier in the day, there was someone I interviewed many years ago who gave the right answers for every question I asked. But the entire interview consisted of him doing, excuse me, folks, I'm going to act this one out as well. Well, um, it was like Macbeth rubbing the blood out of the palms of his hands, having killed the king, all meeting long and the hyperventilating, and every answer was right. But I couldn't submit him because I could just see my client going, oh my God, oh my God. You talk about wanting to back out of a situation. And for women, folks, you trust your gut. I never go mm -hmm. against women in their gut in these situations. Mm -hmm. Always feel safe. And if you're not, always keep the door open and make sure there are others there. Mm -hmm. And It's funny that um, because I, it, now, now you talk about that, it, it's exactly like I'm reflecting back on my time in interviewing and I always had used to have this thing when the last corporate in, in, recruiter role that I had, it was kind of like the energy that fitted, you know, could I see this person? Could I, in that environment? And yeah, exactly, exactly what you say. So, And, and the funny thing with that is I'm not a believer that companies know how to hire for fit. Mm. And, and I know that's a paradox that we know they're looking for fit, but they're completely incapable of evaluating you. Mm. And I say that, well, there's two reasons. One is a statistic, and that's within one year of hiring someone. I don't think this is purely U.S.-centric, but within one year of hiring someone, most managers, more than, it's between 50 and 62% of managers, depending upon where you see the statistic, have buyer's remorse for the decision they made to hire the person. Mm. Now, I believe that's because the process involves everyone lying to one another. Because when you think about it, as a job hunter, you're going on interviews, and you're trying to put on <clears throat> a good facade. I can do this job, no problem, right? But, you know, when I worked in recruiting, this took me a little while to figure out. Like, that one I got down right away. Job hunters exaggerate. But it took me a while to figure out that my corporate clients were exaggerating too. And it came to me one day when I was joking with someone and I said, you know, I've never heard of a hiring manager ever say to a job candidate, you know, I've got a problem. And, you know, I need, well, let me just put it succinctly. My predecessor got fired and so did hers. I need to hire someone to save my butt. I'm hoping it's you. No one ever says that. They all talk mm. about a great team of people. <clears throat> you know, we've got a wonderful environment here. Did I mention we're like family? <laughs> maybe in maybe in the holiday movies, those kind of families where they want to kill one another. <laughs> but not, it's not true. And you only find out when you're there. Yeah. So given the fact that you're on good behavior, and so are they, how do you know what you're hiring for yeah. if both of you are trying to fool one another? Mm -hmm. Now, this is where I get into my quick message about third-party recruiters. The good ones are the ones that are just the messengers of the lies to each other, <laughs> to the other party. There are bad mm -hmm. ones that just lie outright. Those people are despicable. It's awful. And we're not talking about those. The recruiter is often stuck in the middle, passing the messages to the other person, and thus they get blamed all the time for why the jobs don't get uh, don't work out for the candidate, and why employers are disappointed, and no one looks in the mirror at their own participation in this. 
it's rare that you get a hiring manager ever saying to a candidate, you know, I do have some problems around here. You know, I've, you know, half my staff is terrific and I'm looking for someone I can really rely upon because we've got deficiencies in this. And um, it seems like you have this kind of a background, but I'm going to really rely upon you heavily for this because the person I have in this role isn't as strong as they like to think they are. Could you help them get stronger? If No one ever says this kind of stuff. Mm. And that would go a long way toward, you know, honesty. Mm. Like, oh, it's a ter it's an amazing thing. We talk about honesty. Mm. So yeah. that's that's really oh, there's there's a third acronym, yeah. by the way. PAR. Problem action result. I think of that as being C-suite oriented. You know, you're defining the problem in the environment that you just walked out of or you're leaving, uh, what it was that you did and the result. It's really not radically different. It's a little bit more simplified. And folks, if you can't remember the other acronyms, just go with problem action result. Mm, <laughs> it, yeah. It'll work for you too, but it's more textured if you use the others. Yeah, fantastic. We got a question from Francisca. And this is a question that a lot of lot of people get asked: is um, where can you see yourself in five years? It's always an unnerving question. What are your thoughts on it? You know, we did not know that COVID will, you know, wipe out hundreds and thousands of jobs in even in February. Forget about last year, right? So you know, it's it's so unpredictable. How would you so really it, answer it that question? It tends to be a less experienced person who's asked this question. You know, once you're a veteran individual, once you're a more established person, this question drops off the radar. So, folks, you know, if you're genuine and you're stuck with this, you know, I'll help you. And don't worry about it after this job search or the next one. My belief is that you answer this question by saying, you know, I have some ideas about where I'd like to go. You know, I could see myself doing such and such, but or see myself doing this. And I'm considering going back to school for such and such. And my thinking is we live in very adaptable times, very flexible times, very fluid times. And more than anything, I know I'm going to need to adapt. And what I'm also looking for in joining an organization is a relationship with my ma manager where I can be influenced because I know I don't have all the answers. I want to develop a relationship with my manager where I can look for input and advice and counsel and guidance because I don't know what's possible here and no one knows what's going to be possible in the next three years. And mm. you can use the COVID example. You know, after all, who would have thought of COVID? <laughs> you know, three, one of the funny jokes uh, that happened right after COVID hit was the anyone who answered the question, where do you see yourself five years from now? five years ago was wrong. <laughs> they gave the wrong answer. So it's the thing about acknowledging the truth. Mm. That is, I'm not absolutely sure. And the idea is, again, go back to the idea of acting. It's the sincerity with which you answer the question that's important. If it sounds like a canned, rehearsed answer, you're not authentic. And mm. people smell that and you're not going to get hired. Mm -hmm. So one thing that you do when answering that question is you slow your speech down ever so slightly and you have a little bit longer pauses to convey sincerity. Mm -hmm. And what that does is make them want to trust you because they believe this is not prepared. Mm -hmm. even, even though every pause that I use in answering a question like this, I've been doing this for years <laughs> to make my, my point about how to convey sincerity, lowering your voice and softening it a little bit gives the impression that what they're hearing is truthful and sincere. I hope that was helpful. Any more questions yes, for yeah. me? Yeah. Uh, you know, there are no, no more questions coming from the audience. One of the questions, well, we've got one question from YouTube if you want to answer that. It's it's not particularly clear, but I, I imagine that Priya was asking the question. She's saying that when we don't have 
the experience can we really take on interview questions you know in the absence of experience mm -hmm. in certain skill set right and when you are asked the question about um you know obviously you, the resume has been read so you don't have to really worry about um you know whether they, they know about your lack of experience or not but still you know sometimes the the uh, the amount of experience that you have is less than what they wanted right and then you have to you have to really pull few other things to uh you know to really drive that answer what are your thoughts on you know specifically in the uh, entry level roles with a lot of job seekers faces this problem how would you want and them i have to, to say this? a lot of experienced job seekers tackle this as well i had a question from someone that i answered today i'm working you know my ninth book is coming out shortly i'm already almost done with the tenth and the tenth one is about answers to tough interview questions and this is one of the questions i prepped for this morning uh you know for the book and the idea is to recognize that a two-year person can't do the job of a 12-year person or a 20-year person. So that's one reality. All you can do is really be accurate about what you've done and what your abilities are. So that if they hire you, you're not at risk of getting fired because you misrepresented your capabilities. Because the truth of the matter is, you're not going to get hired, probably they made a mistake in the decision or they just pause for a second and say you know we don't really have anyone else in the pipeline let's see what they've got and so the problem's on their side not yours all you can do is represent yourself as well as possible now i believe that there are three dirty words in interviewing that are supposed to be avoided that can show up in answering or in being interviewed when you're not really qualified the first 30 words you never use, whether you're in a situation like this or in any interview, only, I've only done this, I've only done that. Light, <laughs> I have light experience with whatever it is. The third dirty word, which I've only added in the last few months, just, I've just done this, I've just done that. Because what you signal with using these words is I don't really have a lot of confidence in my ability to answer this, this question. Could you talk about, talk with me about something else, please? Just tell them what you know and what you've done. If it's sufficient, great. If it isn't, that's okay, too. You're not going to get hired for a role that you're not qualified for based upon a misrepresentation. And remember, if you misrepresent and you get hired, the downside is pretty bad. You know, Firms do fire people, and you don't want to be that person with the bad reference. So... I hope that was helpful to the viewer. So absolutely, no, that that makes a lot of sense, and I think I, I fully agree with you on that idea of that the interviews are more like a theater performance, and I always go back to the behavioral questions around. There is a story called Hero's Journey, which is somebody yeah. has actually mapped out. You know, Superman, Spider Man, Batman, you know, whichever, and also the 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 mythological heroes as well. Yes. Uh, you know, it actually I, I can actually relate if I if I put the graph and if I look at the star method or the the soar method or any one, it is actually telling a, a story of triumph. But then you come back to the zero again and then say then I leave again and on next morning I was up to my next challenge. So as if you know so that's what i see that it is a theoretical uh you know you know performance that you're giving but the aspect that i really liked in in your thinking is that you know it has to be sincere uh and and genuine about that rather than um you know fluffing it or rather than just you know over exaggerating things because people can catch those things it's, it's so easy i've always one of my coach always said that what you don't say travel faster than what you say uh you know because just because it's in your it's in the unsaid and when you're not saying it you know people can catch whether you're confident about this or not it's so easy it's like trust you know as kb mentioned you know you you just genuinely feel that this person is trustworthy or not i don't know how but sometimes it's just natural instinct that you have Jeff. so you know once again kb any more questions for you 
Yeah, I was just going to make a quick comment and, um, yeah, we're coming up to 45 minutes. So I think the whole thing about it is, like you say, it is a performance and that type of thing. But really, before you go and start your job hunt, it is a time to reflect on who you are, what you want, what you're proud of achieving, what your motivations are, you know, where you, what you've accomplished in your stories. And when you know what you want, um, it's easy and it, it's easy to be honest and be yourself and ultimately that's what you're aiming to match up with the job it's can you do the job that, that's on offer so um you know <clears throat> the preparation is around that sort of self-awareness and self-confidence and self-understanding and that's a really good start to go into um any interview at all i think so um just i think for everyone keep in mind that genuinely it is a matching process and you know jeff's questions to frame up the interview this, you know, describing the job gives you a sense of whether you want that job as well, because you, you've, you've, you've got a choice. And no matter how hard the times are, you know, going into something that doesn't serve you or serve the organisation serves nobody as well. So it's terrible to wake up six months into a mm. job and, and say to yourself, what did I do? Mm. It's an awful moment. And I've talked mm. to too many men and women around the world who have that moment. And that's mm. when they contact me to help them extricate themselves from a mistake that they made. Mm. Now, the employer, the employer isn't supposed to look out for your interests. Mm. You are. And mm. that does start off, as Carolyn says, with understanding what serves you. Mm. What do you need out of this organization? What mm. do you need out of this job? Do I have the skills to do this? If not, mm. we're going to go get the training to upskill myself in order to be able to perform for the kind of role I'm looking for. Mm. Absolutely. So, Jeff, tell tell people where they can find you. Tell people where they can get the book. Where can they do your training? Where can they find you on YouTube? Oh, there's just so many places. <laughs> So I'll start with you two uh, and say, if you go to jobsearchtv.com, that thing brings you directly to my YouTube channel where I've got thousands of videos that you can watch, listen to, or read. I'm going to just restate that. That was back at my blog. <laughs> you can watch my videos on YouTube. Uh, and I've got more than 6,000 about job search, hiring more effectively, managing and leading. You can also watch me on Amazon. If you have a Fire TV or a Fire Stick or a Roku, uh, same applies there. Download the Job Search TV app uh, on Apple TV and maybe 90 some other some odd smart sets. The app to download is BingeNetworks.tv. I also have the number one podcast and Apple podcast for Job Search, No BS Job Search Advice Radio. Uh, we're going to hit episode 2000 in November. Yeah, and there's a little glitch going. I moved hosts from one service to another. I expect it's going to be resolved in the next few days. But if you subscribe an Apple podcast for a couple of days, you're not going to get anything until this has worked out. But uh, again, at this point, it's more than 1950 episodes have been downloaded. Uh, you know, the, the show has been live since November 2010. And, uh, you know, <laughs> it's just a lot of great material there. My book, The Ultimate Job Interview Framework, is going to be available in paperback this week on Amazon. You can order it there, no matter where in the world you are. And uh, what else? Uh, my website, TheBigGameHunter.us. The blog has thousands of posts that you can watch, listen to, or read that will help you in a variety of different ways. If you're interested in one-on-one -on -one coaching, I'm sorry. Now I'm going to go into the real sales pitch. <laughs> <laughs> I'm making sure. You can schedule time for a free discovery call or schedule time for coaching. I'd love to help you. And if you just have a question for me at the site, uh, you can order either and have your question answered and respond with either a three to five minute uh, video and response. Uh, that's it. The big game hunter dot us forward slash video answer uh, or uh, if you want to chat with me for 15 minutes, the biggamehunter.us forward slash live, you can schedule 15 minutes with me. Both of those services I charge for, but they're very inexpensive. Wow. <sighs> Fantastic. You got it. <laughs> Did we forget anything? <laughs> uh, it's, it's certainly possible. There's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Fantastic. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show, Jeff. Um, for everybody who's watching, if you want to follow the hashtag Career Care Package on uh, LinkedIn, if you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe um, and you can rewatch this interview again, time and time again, because there's so many nuggets in. And yeah, it's been absolutely fantastic to have you on the show, Jeff. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Jeff, for you know for spending some time and you know sharing your insights. Uh, and yes, we, me and Caroline will be back today afternoon, three p.m. Melbourne time. So that would be approximately five hours and ten minutes. And we are going to be interviewing uh, Simon Mc, uh, McCorsley about the uh, what happens once your resume hits the uh, the recruiter's inbox. What happens then? So we are going to take a deep into that as well and we are also going to talk about what's the uh, relation of bringing your own you know evidence of your work uh, to the interview as well so that's another thing that we are going to discuss with simon so please uh, do tune in today 3 p.m uh, melbourne time again once again thank you jeff and everyone if you are in victoria or if you're in us also please look after yourself wear mask and keep the social distancing uh in practice. Until then, we'll see you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye for now.